Good evening, everybody. I hope that you're doing well. Whew. Man, oh man, oh man. I am so excited for the work tonight. Um, because I've been asking God some questions. I've been in prayer for myself, for the body of Christ. I've been talking to seasoned saints, men and women of God who are who got some sweat and some blood and some skin in the game, trying to figure out what is going on. What kind of season are we in? I know what the season is in largesse, right? I know what it is in, 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 at the highest levels. We talked about justice. We've talked about, you know, moving forward. We talked about warfare. We've talked about all these things, but what what this lead up is, I have no idea. I know about you, but it's been rough. It's been rough for me. God has been highlighting some of the smallest indiscrepancies and inconsistencies in my walk with him. Things that I thought, surely God, this does not matter to you. And he just keeps bringing them up, bringing them up before my face, bringing them up, um, making me deal with them, making me see them. He doesn't allow me to be confused. He doesn't allow me. He doesn't allow me to see it in a way that doesn't make sense. I'm trying to tell y'all something, okay? So today, we're going to teach. By the grace of God, we're going to teach. Um, <laughs> hey, Jason. I'm going to pray. And we're going to go into this thing because the Lord answered some questions for me today. So, Lord, I just thank you. I glorify your name and I lift you up. I exalt you in front of men. I exalt you in front of the eyeballs of your children, Lord God. I say that you are mighty and you are wonderful. You are high and lifted up. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. Let not another one come before you, Lord God, with an accusation or some kind of pointing of the finger saying, God, you did this, you did that. The devil is a liar. Let God be true and every man be a liar. God, you are the one and only way, the truth and the life, the reconciliation. Reconciliation, Jesus, is found in you. We thank you. We ask for your grace and your mercy today. We ask that your spirit lead us into all truth, Lord, that even as your word goes forth, that you begin to highlight for us in our mind's eye, Lord, the things that we're convicted of, the things that we stand guilty of, Lord God, that we might release them and relinquish them under the blood of Jesus, Lord, that we might come into alignment with your will and stop resisting your glory, for your glory is whatever your word would come to do. I ask that you would tear apart and tear asunder the strongholds in us today. I ask, Lord God, that you would build up in us a strength that comes from your vine, which is Christ, a surety that comes from the promises of your word, Lord, and ultimately that when you see us, you would see Christ and be pleased. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, okay, because I could go into prayer right now. That's how amazing this is. So what I want to do, hey, JL, what I want to do is I want us to walk through this Bible study the same exact way God walked through this Bible study with me. I'm going to take you on every twist and every turn he took me because I, I know it was not for nothing, right? So let's start in Matthew 17. Matthew 17. And we're going to have a lot of scripture today. So if you don't, if you can't, if your fingers don't move that fast on your phone or you, 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 you can't flip that fast, write it down. We're in Matthew 17, starting in verse 24. It says, when they came to Capernaum, those who collected the temple tax approached Peter and said, doesn't your teacher pay the temple tax? Yes, he said. When he went into the house, Jesus spoke to him first. What do you think, Simon? From whom do earthly kings collect tariffs and taxes? From their sons or from strangers? From strangers, Peter said then the sons are free Jesus told them he says Simon who do you think earthly kings collect their taxes and their tariffs from from their sons or from strangers Peter says strangers a king's not gonna ask his son for a tax money and Jesus says well then the sons are free so we started here and I said Lord what are we doing where are we at where are we going what are we doing <laughs> And so I started asking questions. If you ever want to know what to do in a Bible study, ask questions. Ask the Holy Spirit questions. You don't have no, you don't need no degree to read this book. Ask the Holy Spirit questions. I said, okay, we're in Capernaum and they're asking for a temple tax. What's a temple tax? What's that? The temple tax is called the census tax and it's found in Exodus 30. Can we get a foundation set? Let's do it. In Exodus 30, verse 11. 
God is giving Moses instructions about the building of his temple. He's instructing him. I want you to make it like this. I want it to look like that. I want y'all to do this up in there. This is what I want. And in Exodus 30, he talks about this temple tax. He says, when you take the census, you know, when you count how many people are in the nation, when you take the census of the people of Israel, then each shall give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them. Each one needs to give a ransom for his life to the Lord when you number them, that there would be no plague among them when you number them. Each one who is numbered in the census shall give this, half a shekel. Now what's a shekel? A shekel is an amount, it's a weight. Because remember back then they weren't printing money like the great USA. They were counting their money out in actual tangible materials and resources. So a shekel was a, is a weighted amount, right? So he says, I want you to give half a shekel according to the shekel of the sanctuary. Half a shekel as an offering to the Lord. I like saying shekel. Everyone who is numbered in the census from 20 years old and up shall give the Lord's offering. The rich shall give no more and the poor shall not give less than the half shekel when you give the Lord's offering to make atonement for your lives. You shall take the atonement money from the people of Israel and shall give it in service to the tent of meeting. So this is going to help with the cost to run the sanctuary, you know, keep the lights on, keep the air running. Right. He says that that it may bring the people of Israel. Oops, sorry, y'all to remembrance before the Lord so as to make atonement for your lives. So as to make atonement for your lives. Amen. Now, hmm. There are two words that stick out in this scripture. Two words that stick out. Atonement and ransom. Ransom and atonement. The Lord says, I want you to get this money from these people. Now, two shekels is not a lot. A half a shekel is not a lot. A half a shekel would have bought you two sheep. A half a shekel is not a lot of money. And notice that the Lord is not compromising on this. He doesn't say if you're usually in, in some of these Old Testament instructions, he'll say, if you don't have enough money, you can borrow this from somebody else. Or if you don't have enough, you can use this instead. Not so with this. He says, if you're richer than this, don't think you're doing big, bad things by giving more. And if you're poor, you better find you a half a shekel. Everybody's giving a half of a shekel. I really like to say shekel. Right. He says this. This tax is for is your ransom that you paid to the Lord. Now, I don't know if you've watched any. Um, I don't know why it keeps doing this. I don't know why, if you've watched any um, like CSI or, you know, any kind of. Um, what do you call it? CSI or any of those little detective shows you probably haven't heard the word ransom in a while. The word ransom is a sum of money or another payment that is demanded or paid for the release of a prisoner. So the Lord says, y'all need to give me some ransom money. You're prisoners and I need you to pay me ransom. Every time somebody comes of age, I need ransom money, pay me. Now y'all, can, can I be up front? When I read this, I said, why is the Lord asking for ransom money from his people? Why is the Lord asking the people to pay him money as if he's the person that's holding them captive? We know we're held captive by sin. Oh, gosh. So why is the Lord asking for ransom money? Again, remember, real Bible studies? You want to learn? Ask questions. Put that in the back of your head. Why is the Lord asking for ransom money? Ransom money is what you pay to get free. That's what you pay to get free, right? The other word that we heard there was atonement. Atonement is a reparation for wrong or injury. I'm a word girl, so we're going to have to break that down some more. So a ransom is what you pay somebody to get free. I got your kid held ransom. Give me, give me $35,000 in ransom money and I will set them free. You pay the kidnapper money to set the people free. Atonement, because remember he says when you give him this ransom money, it's to make atonement for your life. That word atonement means to repar a reparation for what's wrong. A reparation is just means to make amends for something that you've done that's wrong. So this is how you make amends. I'll give you an example, right? I know y'all know what I'm talking about, but I'll give you an example. To make amends says, oh, you know what? My husband, I was so rude to him the other night. I was so rude and I shouldn't have done that. I was wrong. I'm going to cook his favorite meal. That's making amends. That's a reparation. 
When we talk about black people, they say they want reparations. Y'all did us so wrong. We want you to make amends with dollars and cents. Okay. That's what this is. This scripture in Exodus is talking about. So if we go back to our beginning scripture, where it says that the people in Capernaum were coming to Jesus and Peter saying, don't y'all pay the, the ransom? Aren't y'all going to pay the temple tax? And Jesus asked Peter a very telling question. He says, who pays taxes to the king? Do the sons pay taxes to the king? Or do the foreigners, the people who are passing through, the people who aren't of any family relation, who pays taxes to a king? Peter says, well, obviously the foreigners, not his family. Then Jesus says, then the sons are free. Now, on the surface level, Jesus is saying, I don't need to be paying anybody taxes. I'm the son of God. Why, do, why does the son of God need to pay taxes to God? Why does the son of God need to pay ransom to God? Right? Because here's the theme in Matthew 16, 17, as we're running up to this point. The theme is, it is being revealed that Christ is the son of God. You know, we first see this, right? When we see Peter, when Jesus asks the disciples, who do you think I am? Who do, the, who do they say I am? Some say you're a prophet. Some say you're Elijah. And then Jesus says, well, who do you say that I am? And in Matthew 16, verse 16, it says, Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, the son of the living God. You're the son of God. Remember, Jesus' favorite title was son of man. Son of God is a, is a curveball, right? So he says, you're the Messiah, the son of the living God. Jesus says, you're blessed because flesh and blood didn't reveal that to you. It was my father in heaven, right? Then we go on a little bit further at the beginning of Matthew 17, where our scripture is found. There's this transfiguration that happens where Jesus changes. He goes to the top of a mountain with three of his disciples and he puts on a little bit of his glory. And out of the clouds, God says to them, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So what Jesus has been doing is revealing the fact that he's the son of God. That's what he's been doing. Jesus has been revealing that he's the son of God. So when he gets to this part where they're asking for money, they say, who? He says, who, who should be paying God money? Foreigners or sons? And Peter says, not the sons. And God says, and Jesus says, well, the sons are free. And Jason, it looks like, who is that? That's Jesus. Jesus is the tax collector. He collected our taxes on the cross. Come on. My Lord is a G. You are not lying. So now Jesus does all of these things. He says all of these things. I'm trying to say on my notes, y'all, because if not, I'll get too happy. Christ says the sons are free. What are they free from? They're free from that temple tax. Well, what does that temple tax represent? Atonement and ransom. Right. Remember, we defined those words. They're free from reparations. They're free from having to make amends. He says, if you're a son of God, you do not have to make amends with God anymore. See, the thing about the temple tax in the Old Testament is it was also talked about when they talked about the lamb that was slain for the sins of the nation. It happened once every year. Right. So every year, these people had to make amends with God by cleansing off their sins with the blood. And every census, they had to make amends with God by paying him a ransom to atone for what they had done wrong. They're making amends over and over and over again, making amends, making amends. I'm sorry, Lord. Here's me making amends. I'm sorry, Lord. Here, take my money. I'm sorry, Lord. Here, kill the lamb. I'm sorry. You see where I'm going with this? OK. Now. Why is it that the sons don't have to make reparations? Why is it? Why is it that the sons, Jesus already, he already gave you the curveball. Why is it that the sons don't have to pay the tax? Matthew 20, 28, to back up what Jesus said. It says, for even the son of man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. Christ gave his life as a ransom. Christ paid God, not Satan. I'm going to prove it. God, Jesus paid God what was owed to let the prisoners free. Jesus paid God what was owed to set the prisoners free. I know it sounds backwards because it sounded backwards to me when I read it, but I promise you we're going to look it out. We're going to search it out. It is because of Christ giving up his life. It is a life for a life. That's the ransom. I gave a life. Let free the life. 
right? It's because of this that we are made free. John verse uh, John chapter one, verse 12 says, but to all who, who did receive him, him being Christ, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave them the right to become children of God. He gave them the right to become children of God. When you put your trust in Christ and you believe in his name, which is the, the name that covers you, when you put your belief in him, his life becomes the payment for your ransom because you were being held captive. But he comes and he gives his life as ransom from you. I'm not talking about cleansing you of your sins. You can be free and unclean. Oh yeah, you can definitely be free and unclean. Jesus is giving of his life. The breaking of the bread was so that you might be free from your bondage. Free, right? This is how we know Christ foreshadowed this because I want to I know I'm going through a lot of scripture and I pray you're keeping up right but the Old Testament and the New Testament work hand in hand come on pastor he says the wages of sin is death that's it the wages of sin is death so we we're looking in the New Testament where Jesus is talking about I've paid this ransom the sons of God are free the sons are free from having to pay the ransom he doesn't say because he's paid it he just says the sons are free because the ransom has been paid. Who paid it? Christ. He said, I gave my life as a ransom for many. And if you believe in my name, you will receive that ransom. Why does this thing keep doing that? Sorry, y'all. It's so frustrating. Sorry. He says, if you receive my name, you will receive this ransom. So you don't have to worry about paying it. We see this foreshadowed, foreshadowing in the Old Testament, painting a shadow of Christ. Because can I tell you what Moses uh-uh, this thing has to stop. Can I tell you what Moses had to do? Come on now. Can I tell you what Moses had to do with that money? The money that they collected from, remember it was for the service of the temple? The first time they took it up, that money was used as the base or the foundation for the temple and the veil. Now, I know I'm real Old Testament, y'all. But when I say the silver used for the ransom was used as the base for the sanctuary. In Moses' time, the temple was made out of, out of cloths and poles and it was a tent. It was called the tent of meeting, right? This wasn't no big old grand thing like Solomon. They were walking around in the wilderness, right? So we have this, this tabernacle and this tabernacle has all these pillars that hold up all these different cloths to make it into like an enclosed space. Every single one of those pillars had melted down silver at the base of it. That ransom that they paid for themselves, it was the foundation for the erection of this holy place. Not only was that silver the base of the foundation for the holy place, it was the base for the foundation of the veil that separated common things from holy things, the holies of holies. It was the foundation for entrance into the holies of holies. So God, for Jesus to pay that ransom to God, he set a foundation. This is frustrating me. He set a foundation. Christ set a foundation for us to be able to enter into communion with God and to eventually go past into the Holy of Holies, into his presence. That's if you that's if you want to study it out, right? Let's keep going. So we have Christ who has said the sons are free from reparations. They're free from having to atone. The Bible foreshadows it. So this is where we get to the meat of this because the Bible, this Bible study is called Stop Making Amends and Just Die Already. Foreigners are the people who make amends. Remember I told you at the beginning I've been praying and I was like, Lord, what is happening? What is happening, Lord? There are brothers in Christ that, that seem so hungry, but we can't get it together. There's so many brothers and sisters in Christ that want to go into prayer, but they don't pray. They want to do this and they don't do that. Or they start and then they fall off. They start and then they fall off. It's like watching people try to get trying to get a good run on Weight Watchers. Like, oh, I'll do it. I got it. And then the next day they're on a binge. I'll do it. I got it. And the next day they're in the club. What's happening? What's happening? What's going on, Lord? These are people that I know are thirsty for you. Foreigners seek a price to make amends. Foreigners. People who are not people who are not the sons and daughters of God are looking for ways to make amends. 
And here's where the issue is. Here's where the rub is. We aren't foreigners. Or at least we aren't supposed to act like that. Hmm. We aren't foreigners. We don't go before the Lord. This is why it's so important. It's so important to remember what repentance really is. Repentance is not, I'm sorry. Foreigners say, I'm sorry. People who are Gentiles, uncovered, the uncovered of Christ make amends with God. They say things like, oh, it was so bad that I stole that. I should volunteer for 10 hours and they make amends. They say, oh man, I was so rude to Kathy. I know what I'll do. I'll bake her a cake. They make amends. They give reparations. They say, hmm, what price can I pay to atone for the wrong that I've done? Come on, thing. What price can I pay to atone for the wrong that I've done? What price? That's what foreigners say. Let's go to Matthew 15. This thing is going to get on my nerves. Matthew 15, verse 8. It says, Jesus is talking about the, the, the Pharisees. He says, this people honors me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. They worship me in vain, teaching as doctrines human commands. That's Matthew 15, 8 and 9. People, these people honor me with their lips. Lord, I love you. Lord, you're amazing. I'm a Christian. Pastor Doug told a story about that at church on Sunday. Somebody comes in and they say, oh, well, you know, I'm a Christian. I've been studying about Ruth and Delilah and Mary and John and Luke and, and Ethel. I'm a Christian. I just love that guy, Jesus. They honor, they honor him with their lips, but their hearts are far from them. Why? Because they're making amends. They have, when people make amends, it has nothing to do with the fact that they want to try to right what was wrong. They want to make up for it. See, the difference between the response of a foreigner and the response of a son with, let's say, my marriage. If I treat my husband poorly and I say, oh, I want to make amends, I'll, I'll bake him a cake or I'll cook his favorite meal. But if I want to be a daughter of Christ, I say, Lord, forgive me. Help me to change my mind so that I will not transgress against my husband with disrespect again. Sons and daughters are interested in the heart of God, not making amends. And so what we're seeing in the body of Christ are people who don't realize that their identity is as a daughter or a son. Therefore, they are acting out as a foreigner instead of a son. You're acting like a foreigner, so when you mess up, you go before God with your paltry apologies, asking him, what can I do to be better? Maybe if I prayed more, maybe if I worshiped better, maybe if I showed up to this Sunday service, or maybe if I made it to that Bible study, that'll make amends, right, God? That'll fix that wrong. I know I did some things that weren't right this week. Maybe if I give a bigger offering. That's what we do. That's what we do. We act like foreigners looking for the price of the tax so that we can be absolved. We act like foreigners. We act like people who have no relationship with God looking for what can we give you so that you'll look at me pleasantly. I know I shouldn't have did it, so what, can, what do you want from me? What is the price? What's the price, God? Think about it in Matthew when, God's, when Jesus says there are going to be people who stand before him and they say, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we preach in your name? And he says, depart from me. I never knew you, you lawbreakers, you command, you people who are who don't keep the commands of God. I never knew you. Why? Because they thought, well, I'm sure if I well, you know what? I'm going to lay hands on this person and pray and prophesy. And that surely, surely that will wipe the slate clean. Surely. False. Wrong. <laughs> That's for foreigners. That's for foreigners. So what do sons do? First of all, sons follow the example of Christ and they die to their will. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. Think about the Garden of Gethsemane. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus is, is about to go. He knows he's about to start this walk to Calvary. And he knows it's going to be horrible. 
He knows it's going to be the most insane amount of pain and trial and tribulation that anybody's ever been through. He knows. He gets on his knees and he tells his friends to pray. His disciples, his friends. He says, pray y'all, pray, 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 pray y'all. Somebody pray. Right? And when he's sitting there praying, he says, Lord, if it be your will, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, your will be done. In that moment, Christ dies to his will. He makes it very plain, Lord, if it can happen, if it be at all possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Jesus was bleeding out of his eyeballs. That's how in distress, that's how hard this, this, this commitment was. But he dies to his will. That's what sons do. That's what daughters do. We don't make amends, we die. We follow the example of Christ and we die. We be, we, we die. And I mean, there's really, <laughs> there's really nothing else to do. When we die to our will and we die to our flesh and our desires, we become a living sacrifice. I want to look at Galatians 2. Galatians 2, starting in verse 19, Paul says this, For when I tried to keep the law, it condemned me. So I died to the law. I stopped trying to meet all its requirements so that I might live for God. I stopped trying to pay this tax. I stopped trying to look for ways to make myself right. And I just lived for God. How did I do that? Well, verse 20 says, my old self was crucified with Christ. It was no longer I who lived, but Christ who lived in me. So I live in this earthly body by trusting in the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. That's how I became. Yes, Jason, we die to ourselves and ourselves daily. That's how I became a daughter. That's how Paul became a son. He said, I stopped trying to look for ways to appease God. I stopped trying to look for ways to amend what I had done wrong. And I just allowed God to live in me by killing my flesh and letting Christ live by putting my trust in him. Now, this is like a it's like a it's like a negative, right? It's hard to understand sometimes what actually this is saying or how you actually live this out, because when you say things like you don't have to follow any any kind of law, people say, oh, you're godless, you're lawless. Jesus says he's going to rebuke the lawless. But if you die, something in you has to live. Something in you is going to live through your thoughts, through your actions, through your decisions, through the way that you communicate with others. Something is going to be living. Either it's going to be your desires or God. When you give your life to God, he says he works within you his desire and his will to do what is pleasing it to him. So the desire and the will to do what is pleasing to God, he works it in you. It's there. But you have to decide who's going to show up in this body that you have on. Who's going to be the one that responds? Who's going to be the one that spits their hand out to give strength? Who is showing up today? Is it your flesh, which is only concerned about the here, now, and today? Or is it your spirit, which lives through Christ and gives reverence to God and obeys what he puts in you to do? Jason said in Romans 6, 5, For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of, of his resurrection. Amen. We have to choose. Now, remember, I told you there's one question that we've left unanswered. It's in the back. Remember, we stored it back here. That question was, why are people paying a ransom to God as if God is the one that kidnapped them? This doesn't sound like God. <sighs> Let's go to Romans 11 and the Holy Spirit is going to tie this up like a bow. Romans 11, let's start in verse 29. 
Paul says, for God's gifts, I'm going to read this so slow because I need y'all to see, I need y'all to hear this. For God's gifts and his call can never be withdrawn. Once you Gentiles were rebels against God. Remember that you were godless people. You had no way to get back to God. You had no way to the father. He had chosen Israel and that was it. It was either Israel or bust. So he says, once you Gentiles were rebels against God, but when the people of Israel rebelled against him, God was merciful to you instead. Remember, the Bible says that Christ came to his own and his own didn't even know him. He tried the whole entire three year ministry of Jesus Christ never stepped foot outside of the ears for the Jews. He didn't preach to anybody but the Jews when the <coughs> When the Gentiles came sniffing around, Jesus was nowhere to be found. He was there for his own, but his own rejected him. So he says, but the people of Israel rebelled against him and God was merciful to us instead. Now the Israelites are the rebels and God's mercy has come to us so that they too will share in God's mercy. The Bible talks about how when Israel sees how God is starting to show love to the Gentiles, that Israel will become jealous and come back. Right? So God showing mercy to us draws back his rebellious prodigal son. Right? Now look at this. Now they are rebels and God's mercy has come to you so that they too will share in God's mercy. Verse 32. For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience. So that he could have mercy on everyone. Remember a ransom is a price that you pay to set someone free. So who imprisoned you? If we look at Romans 11 verse 32 it says for God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience. So that he could have mercy on everyone. And before you call me a heretic. And before you say I'm reading scripture out of context, or before you say whatever you need to say to make God stay cuddly and God stay cute to you. God imprisoned everyone in disobedience because of that same scripture that says, let no man say that he has been without sin. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It is your very imprisonment to disobedience that allows you to see that God is God and you are not. So God allowed us to be imprisoned in disobedience so that we would know. Come on, thing. Come on back. Come on. This thing is getting on my nerves. The devil is a liar. There we go. God chained us up in disobedience so that we might come to know for ourselves his mercy. If Eve is guilty of anything in the in the Old Testament in Genesis by eating that apple, it was not knowing God for herself. She was deceived about who God was. She was deceived by Satan into thinking that God was not who he presented himself to be. Thank you, Pastor Doug, because the devil thinks I'm not playing. I'm not going nowhere. She was deceived. The Bible says that Adam sinned, but Eve was deceived. I thought what, Satan is saying that God really, really is hiding something from me. Well, Satan is saying, so now we're all tied up in disobedience. We're all imprisoned in disobedience. And he, and God says, see, you need me to rescue. You didn't know I had mercy, but it wasn't until you went through that. You didn't know I had grace until you went through that. But now that you see, you see now that you need a ransom. You see now that you are full of sin. You see now that your estimation is no wisdom at all. You see now that what you thought was good is actually not good. What you thought was good for you is actually not good for you. What you thought would be good to eat is actually disgusting and causes death now that you see all of these things you now need my grace you need to understand my mercy you need to understand my grace all of us there's some of us that really wish that we could live and die and be robots and just serve God and be done with it I'm one of them I don't want all these choices Lord but it's in these choices it's in these struggles it's in the in the battles that God has already foresaw to see that they are necessary it's in all of these things that I come to know God better there were seasons where I shook my hand at God and I said you're a liar you lied to me. 
and meant it, you guys. I'm not playing. But it's that season that I can sit here and look back on and say, my God, I know him better. Just like Job, who can say, God, you're a bully. You aren't righteous. I've done nothing to deserve this. And when God confronts him at the end of it all, when his, his sickness is healed and he's given back all of his riches and he has a new family and he's so restored and he's so revived and he's so renewed, he comes out of that thing saying, I know God a little bit better. I know what I did not know. And I have to be silent because I thought I knew. I don't. I don't. I don't know. So we've all been imprisoned in sin. Imprisoned. We are all disobedient. God made the laws that way. We're all disobedient. All of us. So that he might show us his mercy. And I know that's something that you might have to wrestle with. I'm a big, I'm a big supporter of wrestling with the word of God. It'll stand the test. It's pretty strong. It's lasted a while. So in verse 32 of, of, of Romans 11, it says, For God has imprisoned everyone in disobedience so that he could have mercy on everybody. So that everybody would come to know God's mercy. And then he says, Oh, how great are God's riches and, the, and wisdom and knowledge. How impossible it is for us to understand his decision and his ways. So he says, I know that's hard to understand that God would allow you to be disobedient. I know it's hard, but how great is his wisdom? He says, for who can know the Lord's thoughts? Who knows enough to give him advice? And who can give him, um, and who has given him so much that he needs to pay it back? He said, for everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever. Amen. Before you get all these feelings mixed up in your heart about what God did and didn't do, I want you to realize he made you for his purpose, his glory, forever and ever. Amen. But then we get, come on, Jason, he reminds us that we need him. But then we get to the last scripture, Romans 12, 1. It says, and so, dear brothers and sisters, and so is kind of like saying, and in light of all of this, because we see that God has shown the Gentiles mercy by coming to us when Israel was disobedient and then showing us mercy is allowing them an opportunity to come to mercy because we've all been disobedient and we all need mercy. And I know that's all really hard to understand, but we were only made for him anyway. So don't get your panties in a bunch. Romans 12, 1. So in light of all of this, brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God. Brothers and sisters, not people. Brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your body to God because of all he has done for you, because of how he paid that ransom for you. Let them be a living, holy sacrifice, mm -hmm. the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Another translation says this is your only reasonable service. Now, when he says service, reasonable service, he's talking about what a priest would offer in a place of worship in serving the Lord. Your only reasonable way to operate in this temple, to operate in this holy place that Jesus has revealed for you is to come as a living sacrifice because the altar where the sacri sacrifice is offered is in the presence of God. So when you're coming here, now that you've been given access, I want you to come as a holy living sacrifice. He said, don't copy the behavior and the customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Repentance, changing the way you think. Allow God to transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. If you will allow God to change the way you think, if you will allow God to birth repentance in you, not offense, change the way you think, not aggression, not unforgiveness, not bitterness, not entitlement. Those are, that's the way the world thinks. The world says, if you don't say it to me slick, then you owe me an apology. That's the way the world, that's the way the world thinks. Allow God to make you repentant. Can I just say this and just be done with it? Cause ain't nobody coming to my house at the end of the day. If, if, if somebody says something to me, if my husband says, that's why I'm so sick and tired of coming here because you act like you can't clean nothing. And I'm more offended about the way he said it than the fact that what he said is true. That's a problem. I'm more focused on how you stepped on my flesh's toe 
than how you just gave me constructive criticism about the way that I live. I'm so busy avoiding being convicted that I'm willing to have an offense with you so that I don't get convicted. The devil is a liar. That's not how that's going to go. Offer yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to the Lord because you're a priest that has been set free, that can freely offer service. And this altar where you where he receives our sacrifices, it's in a holy place. So give it to him like that. Allow him to make your mind change. Allow him to, uh, to, to birth repentance in you. It's the Holy Spirit that pricks your heart that even starts the conversation of repentance. In Acts 2, when Peter goes forth under the Holy Spirit, preaching the first Holy Spirit filled sermon outside of Jesus, he gives this sermon. The Bible says, and the men and women's hearts were pricked. And they said, what do we do? And the response was, repent. Change the way you think. And be separated. Come out of this perverse generation. The way they think is crooked. The way they think is leaning. The way they think is not God. So come out. How do I come out? Maybe my skirt needs to be longer. Mm, how do I come out? Maybe take out that red lipstick, girl. Be ye separated. Change the way you think. Where they get offended, you should be meek. Do you know what meekness is? Meekness is when you're ready to cor be corrected. That's what being meek is. Meek is not just this whole low, humble, I'm dirt position. Meekness says, I'm, I'm correcting you in meekness because I might be guilty of this myself. I'm ready for, I'm ready for you to not maybe receive it so well. And I'm, I'm okay with that. I'm, I'm humble about it. That's meekness. So, help me, Holy Ghost, because we're done. That's the last scripture. I know it was like 18 scriptures, but that's all right. Jesus says to Peter, you don't have to worry about making amends with God. You don't have to worry about paying that tax. You don't have to worry about making amends with God. The sons are free. Christ giving his life for us, paid the ransom that God had on your head in disobedience so that you might have an opportunity to receive mercy. So that you might be among the many who can say, I know God. I know him. Jesus, when he prays his priestly prayer in John 17, he says that they might know you. I know him. Because of the ransom that Christ paid for me, I'm free. And I follow after his footsteps by dying. Dying to my flesh. That he might live in me. That the works done in me might be Christ. And when God sees my works, he'll say, that is my son in whom I'm well pleased. And then I can be like Paul and say, follow after me as I follow after Christ. Because I'm dead. And it's Christ living in me. Then I can say, to live is Christ. And to die is gain. To die is reward. And then I can say that. The message today for everybody in the body of Christ that would hear it. Stop trying to make amends with God. Stop. That's why you keep getting off track. You keep getting off track. You keep falling off the horse because you're making amends. You're trying to right a wrong. The only way to right your wrong is to change your mind. And allow your heart to be renewed by the Spirit of God. That is the only way. That's the only way. The only way. The only way. You can't join enough ministries to make it right with God. You can't. Pray for enough people to make it right with God. You can't shout loud enough to make it right with God. You can't cry enough tears at the altar to make it right with God. There is no other way to make amends with God except allow Jesus to pay that ransom. Allow Jesus to make amends with God on your behalf once and for all. Then follow his, follow his, his footsteps and die. And allow Christ to live within you. Because he is the one that God is pleased with. He is the blood that was appropriate for the shedding. 
for the sacrifice. It's God. It's only, That's it. It's, it's Jesus and God. That's it. We are made in his image. Let us follow after his footsteps. So the last thing, that's it. I mean, I would behoove everybody. I would encourage everybody to go into prayer and ask the Lord to forgive us. Not in a nonchalant way. Oh, I'm sorry. But to forgive us for trying to make amends when we know that there's never going to be. Those people had to keep paying that money. Those people had to keep paying that money. They came to Jesus looking like, don't you have the money? You know, like 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 some kind of shakedown. Don't you have the money? Jesus says, no, I'm free. You're free. So let's stop focusing on how to make amends and figure out, Lord, how can I submit myself to you that you might change my heart? Let's stop making amends and die already. I know this Bible study was a little different. It was a little rough with this camera foolishness. But to God be the glory, regardless of it all. I, if you need anything, please reach out. I love you. Pastor Christine, Pastor Doug love you. <laughs> the Reclaimed Church family love you. I'm posting this on all kind of pages. So Rebirth and Glow, Women of Word, The Fivefold, all these people. Everybody loves you. We all love you. If you need something, let us know. And be blessed. I love y'all. Have a good night.